Coming up on Now See This. When the jet skis run at a water park, the splash zone becomes the crash zone. When a Turkish bride says till death do us part, the groom almost does. And for a family out deep sea fishing, their biggest concern is not the one that got away. A kid hits the skids, a sled hits the head, and some wagons start dragging. Think you've seen it all? Now see this. For centuries, the cascading rapids of Niagara Falls have attracted scores of daredevils seeking to cheat death as they ride over the precipice. But this man came to the falls to embrace death. Five feet from the edge, he changed his mind. When I arrived at the scene and saw the victim, I literally did a double take. I thought there must be some, I must be seeing this from a wrong angle. The rushing water is a bitterly cold 33 degrees. At this temperature, it only takes five minutes for a person to get hypothermia. This man has been soaking in it for almost an hour. Unofficially, in the back of my mind, I put his chances at 10% or less. Battalion Chief John Jacoby and members of the New York State Park Police rush to secure some rescue lines as the full force of the river pushes against the victim. I've been on the fire department for 29 years, and in 29 years, this is the worst, most unusual situation I've ever come across. Rescuers call the hydroelectric plant upstream to turn down the flow of water. But it's already down as low as it can go, and the current's still too strong for the victim to reach shore on his own. I was asking for every single piece of rescue rope that we had, knowing full well that because of the location of the victim, it was going to be real, real tough to get to him. Sergeant Pat Moriarty and firefighter Gary Carella decide to brave the freezing fury of the river to get the victim out. But even with their cold water rescue suits tethered to shore, they know that one misstep near the edge would be fatal. As far as slipping and going over the falls, it's a one-way ride. Off, firefighters and officers up above us uh, had our lives in their hands uh, when they were hanging onto those ropes. But the undercurrent is even stronger than the men thought, and they can't risk going in. Any hope of a quick rescue disappears. It's clear they will need outside help. The position of that victim right at the brink of the falls and the fact that he was 20 to 25 feet from shore, uh, they knew that we were going to need a helicopter. Officers on the ground call Captain Kevin Caffrey of the Erie County Sheriff's Department. The seasoned pilot quickly crests the horizon in the Air One rescue helicopter. When we initially arrived, uh, we couldn't believe our eyes when we actually saw that the gentleman was actually within a few feet of going over the brink. Caffrey and his partner immediately hook up a rescue basket and hover in close to the falls. But there's a problem. We attempted to fly in over the brink and pick him off, but unfortunately, due to the, the high winds and the, uh, the updrafts coming off the brink of the falls, uh, the basket would swing all over the place, and also I had trouble trying to control the aircraft. Rescuers can't risk the basket blowing into the victim and knocking him off his feet. Caffrey will have to rethink his approach. Meanwhile, Moriarty and Corella try to get a life ring to the man, but that's not going well either. Unfortunately, the current was running from the victim diagonally towards us. So as we threw the ring out, it, instead of going towards the victim, it was being swept away. Moriarty can see the man is losing hope, but their shouts of encouragement are being drowned out by the deafening roar of the falls. I kept giving him a thumbs up just to let him know that uh, we were still working, we still were coming towards him. By now, the man has been stuck in this precarious position for over an hour and a half. The only thing keeping him from dropping 180 feet to the rocks below is a slippery foothold on an underwater stone. If he even tries to shift position, the water will take him down. To be that victim in the falls at that point, the current would be dragging at his legs, attempting to pull him over the falls. Immediately behind him is 
a precipice that leads to certain death. And he has nothing to do but wait and pray that the rescuers are able to get to him. Then the three agencies come up with a way to consolidate their efforts. I spoke with uh, members of the uh, New York State Park Police and asked if they could possibly give us a rescue ring and leave it attached to the shore along with the, uh, the firefighters holding on to the rope. And we would attempt to drop that rescue ring to the subject in the water. Gaffrey's partner holds onto the ring as the captain tries to find the best place to release it. But the victim is getting weaker, and there's not much time for second guessing. The officers on the shore were calling to us and said, Air One, if you can't get him now, he's going over. So, I mean, the pressure was on. But as the helicopter moves into position, the man starts to stumble. The chopper's downwash blows him off his feet. I thought that was it. I thought he was going over the edge. As soon as he dropped down, uh, my heart sank. Uh, we knew darn well that uh, he only had a few seconds to live after he had been knocked over. Caffrey's partner quickly drops the ring. Amazingly, it floats right to the victim. Rescuers can't believe their luck as he grabs hold. I don't know what enabled him to do it, but when he was able to do it, all of us on the shore almost wanted to stand up and cheer. It was incredible. But the celebration is short-lived. The current immediately sweeps the man under an ice shelf. The two rescue swimmers will have to fight the force of the rapids after all. If they don't reach the victim quickly, the jutting ice will trap him under the water and he will drown. With their suits still tethered to the shore, the men make their way over. Only a small portion of the man's arm is sticking out of the ice, and Sergeant Moriarty grabs it. The victim said to me, please don't let me go. And I told him, don't worry, we're not gonna let go of you. The officer smashes through the shelf and tugs the man out. Firefighter Gary Carello wraps his legs around the victim and shouts to the rescuers on shore. The guys on the top were very anxious to see the victim and our rescuers on top. The officers and firefighters pulled with all their might. And finally, after almost two hours of fighting against the fate he almost chose, the victim is back on land. His body is numb, and the severe hypothermia has temporarily paralyzed his legs. But regardless of his original intentions, he struggled with everything he had left to save the life he almost ended. Now paramedics will too. Incredibly, after a few days in the hospital, his condition is upgraded and the men who risked their lives to save him couldn't be happier. At the end of a day like that, you've earned your salary and you definitely uh, relax after it's all done. It was a rescue fraught with setbacks and no one agency could have done it alone. Without a doubt, uh, the reason this was a successful rescue was teamwork and the professionalism of the firefighters and the police officers involved. Their efforts literally saved a man from the brink of death. There is no way that that man should have survived. And when we walk away and we know that he's on his way to the hospital and he's going to live to see another day is beyond compare. Vacations are a time to relax, to have fun, to be entertained. And the jet ski show at SeaWorld in Brisbane, Australia is the ideal escape for tourists of all ages. But as the performers participate in a racing exhibition, a couple of vacationers are unaware that their quest to get away from it all is about to leave them unable to get away at all. Spectators videotape the show as the jet skiers dazzle the crowd with high-speed racing and high-flying jumps. <laughs> the two racers run neck and neck as they soar over the main ramp. But the force of the landing throws one rider off, sending his jet ski speeding out of control and straight towards the stands. 
strike the front line. Yeah, I'd say there would be a couple people hurt. When the jet ski hits the water, the handlebar breaks off, jamming the throttle at maximum gas. Everyone who can jump out of the way in time does so, but there is one woman who can't. The jet ski misses the woman by inches, but it won't miss a father and his one-year-old son. Upul Leonagi jumps in front of the speeding jet ski, saving his child's life, but breaking his own right leg. The accident is a showstopper. We will be not commencing with the show. The show will not commence. Leonagi is taken to the hospital, where he will stay for the next four days. But while this accident will cause Upal Leonagi to spend his summer on crutches, he'll at least be spending the summer with his son. Home video captures two small boys on the lookout for big game. Nine-year-old Jonathan Spiro and his seven-year-old brother Nicholas from Laguna Niguel, California, are vacationing with their parents. They're in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, the blue marlin sport fishing capital of the world. Suddenly, their father Scott gets a bite. Because the fish is so powerful, the boys can only watch as Scott and their mother, Patsy, take turns reeling in the hundreds of yards of line. Can you see him yet? After 15 minutes, they finally catch sight of the mighty marlin. Look at it, jump! Oh! The giant fish jumps from the water, its classic fighting maneuver. Patsy carefully brings the marlin closer as Scott instructs the boys. This is the most important part, guys. Pay attention. Oh! Remember, don't, no slack in the line. Beautiful! Beautiful! Scott takes over, trying to pull the fish alongside the boat. The captain has told him that the marlin could weigh as much as 200 pounds. Really was big, almost 200. Jonathan and Nicholas excitedly press against the boat's railing to get a glimpse of the biggest fish they've ever seen. The jump is thrilling, until it jumps again right into the boat. Patsy rushes her children toward the safety of the cabin. They start laughing, completely unaware of the threat this wild creature poses. The marlin thrashes about fiercely, slashing the air with its dagger-shaped bill. Film it, film it, film it. <laughs> until the crew is finally able to subdue it. <laughs> a jump this close is a magnificent sight. But a landing this close could have been lethal. The marlin is so strong it snaps off one of the sturdy fishing chairs from its pedestal. The fish could easily break a grown man's leg or stab him clean through. Not to mention what it could do to a child. The crew scrambles to bring it under control. Scott urges Patsy to keep rolling tape. Film it, film it, film it. When all the excitement ends, oh my God. Jonathan and Nicholas can hardly believe what they've just witnessed. Every angler dreams of the day when the fishing is so good, the fish practically leap into the boat. Look at it jump! Oh! Today, that scenario came true with a vengeance. Ah! Leaving two wide-eyed boys filled with a fish story their friends will have to see to believe. <laughs> US Route 1 in New Jersey has all the makings of a high-speed thoroughfare. 
with one notable exception. It has intersections. And a car thief in South Brunswick is about to see his escape route come to a dangerous crossroads. The cops catch up with the suspect along the 20 mile stretch of road at speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour. Desperate to evade his pursuers, the driver swerves wildly around slower traffic and blows right through a red light. But increasing congestion finally forces the suspect to brake. The officers know that this is when a chase can get really dangerous. As he approaches another red light, the suspect straddles the white line, not sure which way to go. He doesn't decide quick enough. The impact instantly blows out the suspect's front tires. Sparks fly as his rims grind the pavement. The driver finally pulls the crippled vehicle to the right, where the cops pin him to the curb. The suspect had a completely open lane on his left, but he strayed to the middle, slamming against a driver waiting at a light. The collision tore his car to pieces and took him out of the chase for good. Officers approach with their guns drawn, ready for an aggressive suspect. But they soon realize why the driver made such a devastating error. It turns out this car thief was driving dead drunk. The suspect was lucky to survive. If the center divider had not been there, he would have plowed into oncoming traffic. He'll be charged with Grand Theft Auto and driving under the influence. But at least now traffic will clear the way for him as he rides away in the back of a cruiser. Combine the high-flying world of motocross with the rugged power of snowmobiling. And what do you get? Accidents and crashes that rival sport racing's worst. It's a hybrid form of racing known as snowcross. But instead of motorcycles racing on dirt, the snowmobiles race on top of tons of freezing snow. And unlike their two-wheeled cousins, snowcross sleds aren't nearly as light or quick to stop as motorcycles. Rock-hard studded treads propel the sled. And when an accident happens, these spike treads cause more damage than any motocross tire. At this race in Grand Forks, North Dakota, riders tackle a stretch of moguls on a bed of dirty snow. But as the pack rounds the corner, one jump, does two racers in. Gunning his 500-pound sled, Justin Tate launches over the incline at an angle and lands squarely on the head of Ryan Coe. The injured Coe is soon pinned underneath Tate's snowmobile. Tate calls for help as Coe writhes in pain beneath the monstrous sled. A track official rushes to assist the racers. It takes the strength of both men to lift the snowmobile off Co. The yellow flag goes up. But with the accident scene hidden behind the hill, racers continue to cut past just inches from the down victim. Fortunately, Ryan Co makes it out of this hairy situation with only minor injuries. But crashes like this are more common than you might think. At the Pontiac Silverdome in Michigan, a similar accident is going to take place. Only it's about to happen on the mother of all mogul hills, the King Kong jump. We have got some damaged sleds. We have got some crashes. That will bring out a red flag condition. That will bring out a red flag condition. Soaring over the jump at 30 miles an hour, Robbie Malinowski's sled hits Donald Letty with bone-shattering force. Another sled rams Letty after he hits the ground. The red flag immediately goes up and the race is stopped. We're gonna send everybody else back to the starting line. 
everybody back to the starting line immediately. We have got to... Milanowski waves to stop riders who haven't seen the flag. Letty isn't moving, and it's obvious why. Here comes REMS. Having just taken a studded tread to his body and a fierce blow from another sled, the double impact seems like more than any man could bear without getting seriously injured. And right now, we're going to just assess the situation. But to the crowd's delight, Donald Letty is able to walk away on his own two feet. How about a hand for him? He's up and OK. Great job from the paramedics. As usual, our rider is up and OK. Great news. To compete in a sport this intense, with dangers this big. Snowcross riders don't just need ice beneath their sleds. They need it in their veins. In certain remote regions of southeastern Turkey, weddings are a blast, quite literally. Here, the random firing of guns into the air during wedding ceremonies is a time-honored tradition that dates back to the nomadic days of cannons and sword rattling. Today, swords and cannons have been replaced by handguns and automatic rifles. Even rocket-propelled grenades are used to celebrate the joyous occasion. The Turkish government officially outlawed this dangerous practice more than a decade ago. But it's still observed among wealthier families in the remote villages of Anatolia. And today's celebration will prove to be a real twist on the old shotgun wedding. It begins with a traditional parade through town, where the men show off their hardware. The drunken best man is a bit too eager to fire his weapon gives the groomsmen next to him a scare. But even the kiddies want to celebrate the nuptials in a traditional way. So the groom in the gray suit keeps the party going, stepping right in front of a gun as the best man squeezes the trigger. Without looking where he's aiming, the best man fires off a rapid series of shots. Two shots peel off a flap of the groom's scalp and graze the man standing next to him. A centimeter more, and neither man would have survived their high-caliber haircuts. The groom needs 25 stitches, and more than a dozen pellets remain embedded in his skull. The best man did not make the bride a widow on her wedding day, but he did get a little wedding gift of his own, a pair of silver bracelets from the local police. So if you're planning your wedding, we suggest you leave the artillery at home. And if the best man is giving the toast, Make sure he doesn't shoot off anything but his mouth. Forget Formula One. These fans are about to experience the most thrilling 10 laps in English motorsports. It's the British Grand Prix of caravans, also known as camper trailers. Drivers come from all over England to Bovingdon Raceway in Hertfordshire to compete in this mother of all trailer races. What was once somebody's pride and joy vacation home is ripped, clipped, and stripped of all the hazardous bits, then turned into a lean, mean racing machine. My brother's friend gave me the caravan. All we have to do is like kick out all the interior, take the windows out, just not throw it away, really. Come race time, the tension is thick as the cars and campers take their positions on the track. The parade lap may look like a bunch of vacationers on holiday. But once the green flag drops, the vacation ends and the real fun begins. Just hit anything else that's in front of me, even teammates, doesn't matter. Everyone's getting it. Ever want to take revenge on the rear end of a slow-moving camper? Well, here's your chance. This ain't no sissy stock car race. Mm -hmm. 
even though it's a 10 lap race, there won't be too many running after the first couple of, couple of laps. Is there a strategy to racing on an oval track while dragging around one of these monsters? You can't think it through, nothing's planned. It's, it's a spur of the moment thing, you know? Just take your brain out. That's the best way to do it. <laughs> Close your eyes, that helps. <laughs> After only one lap, the race is stopped because, well, no one can move. The carnage of caravan carcasses litter the track. It's a tragedy of trailer trash. Yet this early camper catastrophe hasn't dampened anyone's spirits. The racers are still raring to go. That was excellent, mate, that was. Enjoyable. 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 Very enjoyable. It's worth half a lap. It is, yeah. All the fun of the fair. After a brief pit stop to untangle everything, the race is restarted with all the heated competition this cavalcade of caravans can pull off. For the next nine laps, the neck and neck action is non-stop. And when it comes to the clinches, these crazy campers let nothing get in their way. Well, almost. Taking the checkered flag is Terry Coke, Cokey to his friends. A 42-year-old master mechanic from Bracknell. His camper has seen better days, but he's not too concerned about its fate. But at least they've got plenty there ready for us for future years to come. As Koki takes his victory lap, the fans are already looking forward to next year's smashing edition of England's preeminent camper crack-up, the British Grand Prix of Caravans.